Americans have been playing baseball for as long as white people have been playing baseball. As the sport began to take hold in popularity post-Civil War, black people were there always. There were organized black teams and they barnstormed. They played against other black teams. They played against white teams. There were blacks who did play with whites on teams. The team was majority white. It may have one or two black players on it. And that seemed to be something that was more acceptable to the white paying public. If they only have one or two black players as opposed to a team that might have majority black players and one or two white players. But as we move forward through history, we see that segregation starts to tighten its hold. That's a clip from the new documentary titled The League, which explores the history of baseball's Negro Leagues using previously unearthed archival footage and never before seen interviews. Join us now, the film's director, Emmy Award winner Sam Pollard. Sam, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I mean, you have us gripped. We're all baseball fans and history fans. So this checks both of those boxes and it sheds new light uh, on this area, on this topic, on these leagues that produced truly not just some of the greatest black baseball players who ever lived, but the greatest players who ever lived, including guys like Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige. So what led you to take on this project? Well, about uh, 10 years ago, a gentleman named Byron Motley, whose dad had been a black Negro League umpire named Bob Motley, they wrote a book together about his dad's adventures in the Negro Leagues, and uh, they wanted to make a film. And Byron had also shot interviews with former Negro League players like Max Manning and Monty Irving. So we started that long journey of trying to raise the money, and it took about seven to eight years before we got mm -hmm. all the money in place, and we started making the film. And it was really a real pleasure to really dig into this very complex and fascinating history. You know, Sam, in, in watching this film, it's, it's incredible the number of great athletes, baseball players, and they happen to be black, and that's why they couldn't play in the major leagues. But the other thing that struck me in watching the film was the idea that when they eventually, some of them were coaxed into the major leagues and allowed to play in the major leagues, players like Larry Doby and Monty Irvin, the teams that they played for in the Negro Leagues were not reimbursed, were not paid for their contracts. So they got them for free. And they played in the major leagues and they were great, great players and everything like that. But but the idea of it is is there's an element of tragedy in this film about all the players who could have been major league players much earlier and were prevented from playing in the major leagues only because of their color. Well, one of the things that was you know, a revelation for me as a filmmaker and as an African American male was really realizing that people like Branch Rickey and others who were you know, involved in the major leagues, didn't want to compensate the Negro League owners, like you just said. I mean, Effa Manley, who was a co-owner of the Newark Eagles, was very, very vocal about that. You know, And when Bill Veck of the Cleveland Indians wanted to sign Larry Doby, she said, you should really compensate me because other white owners hadn't. So he did compensate uh, Effa Manley, but that was a rarity. And it was a tragic thing that happened. I mean, that was a story that no one ever knew. We always knew that Branch Rickey was sort of like a savior, you know, in bringing Jackie Robinson into the major leagues, but he didn't want to play the Kansas City Monarchs for, for Jackie Robinson. He didn't want to pay the Newark Eagles for Don Newcomb. He didn't want to pay, play, pay the Baltimore Elite Giants or Roy Campanella. So these are some really interesting revelations to talk about these phenomenal players who never had an opportunity in, to play in the major league. Sam, talk also about how on the other side of the equation, we know a lot of the pain and the uh, humiliation that the black uh, players played in the Negro League had to go through. But it also robbed the American public, the baseball public, of seeing some of the greatest players that ever played uh, because of the color line. And, and because of that, you may had people going into the World Series that may not have been there had we not had this rigid Jim Crow. So America suffered, the sport suffered. Talk about that. 
Well, the series was fascinating, Reverend Nash Often, I mean, you have great players like Cool Papa Bell, you have Satchel Page, you have Josh Gibson, you know, you have Oscar Charleston, you have Buck Leonard, Buck O'Neill, these phenomenal players who had, you know, the athletic ability to really make things happen on the baseball pass. And they weren't able to play, you know, against people like Lou Gehrig or Babe Ruth or Dizzy Dean, you know, except in barnstorming events. So it was a tragedy. I mean, but the positive thing that I take away from this experience, too, is that within our black communities, they gave a form of entertainment and excitement for our people to come out and see our players play, you know. And fortunately, at some point, they realized in the major leagues that they needed to bring in some of these players, not just to be, you know, to, to break the barrier of segregation, but from my perspective, from a profit motive because it was going to bring more people into the to the ballparks. Sam, it's an extraordinary work, and I know you've got some, you've unearthed some never before seen footage and interviews with some of the uh, people who were there. Tell us a little bit, give us a story or two about some of the, the, the big people, personalities, tremendous athletes, like a, like a Josh Gibson or a Satchel Page. What will we learn from this? Well, you'll learn, first of all, that there was a man named Ruth Foster in 1920 who had been a phenomenal pitcher and, an, and a manager and an owner who basically started the Negro National League in Kansas City, Missouri. And then you learn in the 30s there were other you know, people like you know, Gus, Gus Greenlee and Composer, who were also great owners of teams like the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And they were players like, as you just mentioned, Josh Gibson, who's considered on par with Babe Ruth as a home run hitter. Satchel Page, who's probably one of the greatest pitchers of all time. You know, these are great, great players. Cool Papa Bell, who was considered one of the fastest men on the base path. So these stories are told to you in detail. And we were very fortunate. We had a great archival producer who was able to unearth some wonderful, wonderful archival material that I hadn't even seen before. So it's really an extraordinary sort of deep dive into understanding another aspect of American history. I always want to make sure people understand that this history is American history that we all should know about. Thinking about the line about Cool Papa Bell, Mike Barnacle, which is that he could turn off the lights on the wall in his bedroom and be in bed before it got dark. He was that fast. Yeah. Was... Uh, but these, but he, the Sam makes a great point. We talk about steroids and how do how do we judge players of that era? And should we say, well, that was just a moment in time? Well, you have to look at players who played back then in the major leagues. They didn't have to play against black players. They have to play against Josh Gibbs, and then have to try to hit Satchel Page. Some of the greatest players in the game were not in the big leagues. You know who used to point that out more often than not when you talk to him about baseball and that era of baseball? Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. Ted Williams would say, you know, I faced a lot of great pitchers and everything like that, but, you know, I always wanted to have the opportunity to play against someone like Satchel Page. Mm -hmm. Sam, one quick question for you before we get out of here. There are villains in this piece. Judge Landis, Kenesaw Mountain Landis, the former commissioner <laughs> of baseball. Talk about him briefly, yeah. if you could. Well, he became the commissioner of baseball after the 1919 Black Sox scandal, and he had a real tight, firm, and hold on the on Major League Baseball. And he was adamant about refusing to see African American players play in the game. And one of the other revelations that we came away learning about was the fact that Paul Robeson, the great Paul Robeson, in the early 1940s, had a meeting with the white major league owners to try to persuade them to rethink this idea of not having African Americans in the major leagues. But Mountain Kennesaw Mountain Landis was still was still opposed to it. You know, he sadly passed away in their in mid 1940s, and Happy Chandler became the baseball commissioner. And that, I think, from my perspective, opened the door to people like Branch Rickey saying, "Now it's time to make these you know overtures to Negro players to bring them into the major leagues." The documentary The League is available to stream now, and as I said, it's full of new interviews, just incredible archival footage. It's a story of baseball, but it's also the story of America. Sam Pollard, thanks so much for your hard work. As you said, seven to eight years to raise the money to get this done, and you have done something extraordinary. Congratulations, and thanks for being here this morning. My pleasure, Willie. Thank you very much.